Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here on this Thursday. Y'all, it's almost the weekend. I'm not even going to lie. I'm going to clean my house a little bit Saturday. And for the rest of the weekend, your girl's going to be under some covers watching YouTube or playing video games. I'm tired. And I'm going to enjoy every second of having nothing to do. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the like button. Hit subscribe if you haven't already and share the video and share the channel with anybody you think might be interested. You guys have been rocking it. I appreciate you guys. It's a really easy way to support the podcast. Sorry if you've been getting bombed with alerts, but I turned those off. So let me know in the comments if they've stopped. I appreciate it. We are going to get into the meat of it today. But first, music fact of the day. Pink Floyd's music was very heavily influenced by jazz and blues. And co-founder Sid Barrett, who was with the band really before they went mainstream, he actually named the group after two of his favorite blues artists, Pink Anderson and Floyd Council. They kept the name after he left. Can't imagine them being called anything different. Well, if you're on YouTube, you see this picture in the top right corner. That would be a new picture of Lori Vallow. How did we get that picture? Well, Lori was extradited while we were all snug in our beds, warm and cuddly. Lori was on an 18-hour road trip from Idaho all the way down to Maricopa County, Arizona. We're going to get into the details of everything. We're going to get into the details right now. Let's go through a really brief rundown of the case so far. Lori was convicted on May 12th in the murders of her children, Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. Also convicted of conspiracy to commit murder for Tammy Daybell, which is Chad Daybell's wife, her newest husband, number five. That's right. Takes up a whole hand. She was also found guilty on grand theft charges that stems from using JJ and Tylee's social security benefits after they were deceased. And now she is in Arizona to face charges for the murder of Charles Vallow and the attempt on Brandon Boudreaux. She was sentenced to life July 31st in prison. At sentencing, we were all starting to talk about the extradition to Arizona. Some people thought it might be a year or more. Some people thought sooner. And here we are, November 30th, just in time for Christmas. I wonder if they've got our Christmas stocking ready. I doubt it. She's in the Australia County Jail. There is approximately a thousand inmates, probably more. And Jody Arias was held in this very jail while she was awaiting trial and also, I believe, retrial the penalty phase. I was in that trial. That's where I met my buddy Kathy Russin from Law and Crime. We've been friends ever since. Very surreal. That was the first big trial I ever sat in. And it will never feel any different than to walk into a courtroom of a case you've been covering and see that defendant in person. It'll send a chill up your spine. I remember being in the Colorado theater shooter trial, James Holmes. I sat right behind him. I could literally smell the guy. And it was interesting because this is why I love sitting in trials. You see things the camera can't catch. So during the trial, when testimony was going on, he kind of just sat there sort of in a daze. The minute that jury went out, he would stand up, stretch, turn around. And there were several times we caught eyes and he kind of grinned at me. You want to talk about creepy? That's creepy. Now it's time for justice for Charles and Brandon. You know, with Charles, it, it makes me so sad because we, we've seen all of those body cam footage videos of him in January of 2019. I mean, just maybe two months after this really kicked into gear where he's warning these police, she's gonna, I'm worried she's going to hurt these kids. She said she was going to murder me. We all know he really wasn't taken seriously at all. And we know what happened to Charles. So what does her cell look like? Well, Jody Arias was in solitary. And if you're on YouTube, this is a photo of her jail cell at the time she was in solitary. And the sheriff today said the same thing's going to be happening to Lori, put in solitary confinement because it's a high-profile trial and they have to protect her while she's there. What kind of food selection is Lori going to have? I'm going to pop it up on the screen here. Looks yummy. If you're on YouTube, you can see just a little sampling of the delicacies that Lori has awaiting her taste buds. I don't even know what that is. I, I know the apple. Maybe some potatoes there, packaged up cookies. I, I don't know if that's like asparagus or broccoli and then that meat stuff. Let's just say I hope she has a bathroom nearby. It looks brutal. Sheriff deputies from Maricopa County left on Monday to go to Idaho to bring her to Arizona. Now, due to weather conditions, 
She was driven from Idaho to Arizona. That would be 18 hours in the car. Can you imagine these people in the car with Lori Vallow for 18 hours? Y'all, I might have just opened that door and just put myself on the interstate. I don't know if I could have handled it. But weather conditions really just made air travel impossible. So that contributed to the decision to drive her down. Maricopa County Sheriff Paul Penzone released a statement. On November 30th, deputies arrived back in Maricopa County just after midnight. Suspect Vallow was booked into the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office ITR facility. That is kind of a intake facility where you get searched, you get fingerprinted. We got that new mugshot of hers. And it says, this is one example of the exceptional, understated, and efficient operations conducted by the extraditions detail of the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. Suspect Lori Vallow will stay in the custody of the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. The district attorney's office will assume prosecution of the allegations. Pursuing criminals and bringing them to justice is what we do, and we're very good at it. So on our first appearance, if you're on YouTube, I'm going to throw this up on the screen right now. The judge says that Lori is appearing on grand jury warrants, meaning the grand jury in Arizona has indicted her. He names the case numbers and says she has a class one felony of conspiracy to commit first degree murder that was committed on October 2nd of 2019. That's Brandon's charge. She also has a second conspiracy to commit first degree murder charge. That happened on July 11th, 2019. That is when Charles Vallow was ambushed, shot, and killed, just trying to pick up his son. He advises her right to an attorney and says he will appoint her a public defender, and he also advises her of her right to remain silent. I bet those people in the car wish she had done that on the way down for 18 hours. Her next hearing is a not guilty arraignment hearing, which is set for December 7th at 8.30 a.m. local time in Phoenix. In their downtown Phoenix Central Court building, Lori softly says, okay. The judge says in both cases, you've been extradited to Arizona, but is currently under the jurisdiction of the Idaho Department of Corrections. And that makes you non-bailable at this hearing. You're not eligible for bail. In either case, you do have your court date. You know, a lawyer will be appointed to you. He asked if she has any questions. She asked if the cases will be combined or will they be done separately? The judge says there are two separate cases, but they're going to be handled at the same hearing. And I believe he means the arraignment. Lori says, okay, and nods her head kind of vigorously. So I'm thinking she's happy with that, thinking this is going to be a one and done. But then he says, you can talk to your lawyer, but they are two separate cases which means you would have two separate proceedings going forward if this goes to trial. And Lori says, okay. He asked if she has any other questions, and she asked just one attorney, or will more attorneys be assigned to me? The judge said at this point in time, you're likely going to have one lawyer represent you at this next hearing. What the Maricopa County Public Defender does at this time with respect to who they assign for counsel for you or how many lawyers you have or anything like that, That'll be between you and your attorney. Lori says, okay. And then he asked if she has any other questions. And of course she does. She says, so you're saying that they'll, will I get to talk to them before that arraignment hearing or just at that arraignment hearing, they'll be assigned? The judge says, typically you do meet your lawyer at the arraignment hearing. And under the circumstances of this case, they may reach out to you before the hearing just to have discussions. There's also a telephone number you're going to have on your paperwork that will be able to connect you to the Maricopa County Public Defender's Office. Lori says, okay, thank you. And they escort her out. Maricopa County Sheriff Paul Penzone, who I think is amazing. This guy's great. He is just stand up to the point and it seems like he has a really, really big heart. He gave a very generous press conference about the extradition process. The sheriff said that Lori is in for two counts of premeditated murder. Deputies left on the 27th to get Lori. It took a day to prepare in Idaho before they actually got her to bring her back. They sent two extradition deputies, a supervisor and a deputy from the canine division, but they brought her not because of the dog, but because she's female and Lori needed a female to be with her during transport. They brought her by car due to weather conditions and they said they took two four-wheel vehicles due to weather. So he said, we'll call it planning an extensive road trip that happens to include bringing back a dangerous fugitive. It took 18 hours and deputies spent four days on the road all together to get there and back. He said they stopped for gas, food, rest areas, things like that to accommodate her needs. And they had four deputies. They sent their FATE detail. That stands for Fugitive Apprehension Tactical Enforcement Unit. And they also sent their extraditions team to facilitate the move. He said they're best at transporting someone deemed to be dangerous. 
He said, make no mistake about it. Sometimes we look at people and judge based on appearance and we go, this is a moderate sized female. What kind of a threat can she be? He said she is as much, if not more, of a threat to the harm of others as any other dangerous criminal they've had in their custody. So we figure out our entire route, where we're going to stay, make sure our employees get the rest necessary to come back safely. They do have a plane for extradition, but it's not commercial. Most of their extraditions are commercial when they do take airplanes. And with circumstances where you're in an environment with a lot of other people who are just regular community members who didn't commit mass murder, and unaware of the circumstances, it enhances that danger. If you go into a location, suddenly there's a storm, your flight's delayed, you're sitting in an airport for hours or days. And because of that, they don't want to mitigate any of those unexpected challenges to get her to Arizona as quickly as possible. Her initial appearance was at 2 a.m. this morning, and she was remanded without bond. The case is now in the hands of the county attorney. It was nice to see Justin Lum checking those mics. Justin Lum is one of the originals on this case, along with Nate Eaton. Justin's been on this case since Charles was shot. I mean, literally since day one when it all started going downhill. He asked what the process dealing with a high-profile inmate is, and this must have been in the planning stages for some time. Lori will be at the jail until the conclusion of these cases, and then once that's over... The county attorney and their attorney will have to determine, but he said he would imagine she would return back to Idaho to serve her time there. He said he doesn't know if it's going to be served consecutively or concurrently if she's found guilty here in Arizona. But whatever the outcome, he said, I'm being respectful of the fact that she is in their custody and now transferred to us for these specific cases. Lori is deemed high security. She'll be isolated in the Australia County Jail. A reporter asked about Lori's demeanor, and the sheriff said, my understanding is that Lori was very sociable the entire trip. I mean, 18 hours, y'all. Picture it, right? She talked quite a bit. Then when asked what she talked about, he said that's something between the deputies, the courts, and the prosecutors. He clarifies, I don't know if she gave any specific statements related to the investigation, but I know they said she was very chatty. Can you guys imagine, like, you know, in one life, like, I was Moroni's wife, and then now I'm the wife of a guy who used to be the brother of Jesus. Can you imagine? I bet, like, how are they not banging their heads on the glass? I don't know. I would love to be a fly on the wall, though. When asked how much it cost to extradite her, he said he did not have an estimate, but he would get that reporter the numbers. He said it wasn't cheap, but he said it's obviously money well spent. He said he doesn't know the specifics of her case inside and out. He's been briefed, but he said he knows the devastation left in her trail, and he knows the importance of making sure that this office handles their business professionally and efficiently. They do 250-plus extraditions a year, and their fate team is approaching 1,000 arrests for this year. That's crazy. Somebody asked about the families that are impacted by this, and he said his heart breaks for them. Anyone who has suffered a loss at the hands of an evil person like this, he said he prays that they find their peace. You have to wonder, what does she feel like being back in Arizona? I mean, this is where she lived a lot of her adult life, with the exception of some time in, in Texas. But this is where her and Charles made a home. This is where Tylee, really, I think Colby and Tylee both expressed this was kind of the most normal time in their lives was when Lori was married to Charles and they lived in Arizona. Tylee had a lot of close friends there. It's going to reopen a lot of wounds for a lot of people with Lori just being back in the state. It's going to be a reminder. So we will be following this. A lot of people have asked, am I going? I'm not sure yet. I'm going to try to make it out there for that arraignment, but we will see. So let's move on to the Chad Daybell hearing. He had a big hearing yesterday. A lot of motions were heard. And the biggest ruling that came out of yesterday's hearing is that Judge Boyce will allow the trial to be live streamed. The courts will be the one controlling the cameras. And, you know, it's interesting because if you remember back not too long ago in some filings in the Brian Koberger case, the man accused of killing the four beautiful University of Idaho students, Zana, Ethan, Kaylee, and Maddie, they mentioned Lori Vallow's trial as an example of cameras being banned in the courtroom. Well, in return, really what Judge Boyce did was adopt or do the same thing that the judge and Brian Koberger did, which was say, yeah, we'll allow streaming, but. We're going to be in charge of the cameras. No public cameras are coming in here. It's better than nothing. What I'm planning to do every day during that trial, I don't think I'll be there the entire trial since it's going to be streamed. Hopefully, I'll go up some, maybe for openings, closings, and some in between. Every day, I'm going to be running that trial on my YouTube page, and we're going to watch together. So let's talk about some other things that happened yesterday. 
Chad's attorney, John Pryor, said the primary reason that Chad wants cameras is for his family in Utah to watch the proceedings. They would like to be able to view it. Cameras keep everybody honest. It keeps the system honest, and they keep the witnesses honest. They keep everyone honest. Totally agree with John Pryor there, but I sat through Lori Vallow's trial, and some of the things that came out in that trial, I don't know that I want my family sitting there watching. I mean, you know, storms can brew. I'm just saying. Prosecutor Rob Wood expressed concern over the length of the trial being eight weeks. This is a death penalty trial and the potential for jurors or witnesses hearing and seeing things they shouldn't. But ultimately, Judge Boyce says we're going to allow it and we're going to control it. So that's put to bed. The next argument to be heard was the state argued to move the trial from Boise, Idaho, Ada County, back down to Fremont County. We know Lori's trial was held in Ada County this year. And Prosecutor Lindsey Blake said of the trial in Boise, during the trial, there was daily coverage, daily reports, interviews being conducted on the courthouse steps daily, and crowds were gathered to hear the verdict. I mean, it was crowded. There were some days it wasn't, but obviously a lot of media coverage for this. While she admits the population is small in Fremont County compared to Boise, she does feel they can find an impartial jury in Fremont County. Look at Alec Murdoch. That was Colleton County, tiny little Colleton County, Walterboro. They found a jury, got their guilty verdict. John Pryor, who wants the trial to stay in Boise, said that there's 300,000 qualified jurors compared to only 2,000 in Fremont County. He went on to say that a large number of witnesses are from Fremont County, and they have family and friends who live in that community. And when picking a jury, he said this is going to create a nightmare. He said we're not going to be able to obtain people who don't know witnesses in this case. The media attention has saturated the entire state and the entire country. Judge Boyce ultimately took the issue under advisement. He will put out a written ruling at some point in the future. When that drops, I'll let you know. That's why you need to subscribe to those notifications because that'll likely be a short until I do a bigger episode. Judge Boyce will allow the indictment to be amended. That was something that happened at Lori's trial, and there are some clerical errors among some others but he's going to allow that to be amended. Judge Boyce denied the motion to limit the state's argument to be consistent with the ones at Lori's trial from earlier this year. Chad's attorney, John Pryor, argued that not doing so could cause the legal argument of who is leading the conspiracy to switch from Lori to Chad at his trial. Now, in his previous filing, we went through that in a prior episode. If you want to find it, Mr. Pryor cited quotes from Lori's trial that indicated she led the conspiracy and Chad just kind of followed her because she was leading him on with sex and stuff. Here's the thing in that, did he not just admit that, that his client committed crimes? Well, yeah, he was there, but she led it. That was something that struck me in the previous filing. I, after I read it, I thought, I mean, he pretty much just said my client did the crime, but okay. So prosecutor Rob Wood said, we will focus on Chad at his trial. We will present the same core theory argued at Lori Vallow's trial. Uh, I've heard that the case against Chad is stronger as far as the evidence. I mean, with Lori, it was a circumstantial case other than that one hair, but juries don't need a bloody palm print at the scene of a crime. All the puzzle pieces fit. Walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, quack, quack, it's a duck. With Chad, we already know they found DNA evidence in his shed that had Tylee Ryan's DNA on it on a pickaxe. The bodies were in his yard. We also know that when JJ was buried, that was the shortest amount of time Alex Cox, Lori Vallow's brother, was there. I think it was maybe 17 minutes to where with Tylee, it was hours. And the roots to that tree where he was found under had been cut. I'm 100% convinced. Chad X Gravedigger, that was pre dug and ready to go. I mean, come on, y'all. It's going to be really awesome to watch him throw Lori under the bus and then back over her three or four times for good measure because, as we know, Lori did not allow that in her trial, and she also did not allow her team to throw her dead brother under the bus and run him back over. So, interesting stuff. It's like quiet, 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 boom. All of a sudden, whole episode dedicated to these two knuckleheads. And it's not a full, long episode, but I want to keep separate. But today, all day, Bell, all day. So let me know what you think in the comments. Are you guys ready to see some justice for Charles and Brandon? Think about Brandon. He was within inches of death, literally. These people were on a mission. And my gosh, just at, like a tornado, you get these two forces that come together and everything in its path totally destroyed. All right, guys, we're going to keep an eye on all this. I'll keep you up to date whether or not I'm going out next week. But in the meantime, hope you have a good rest of your evening. We'll see you soon.